our next speaker is currently a partner at a consulting company called Lyft, where he helps build products and consults with large companies to help them move faster and think more like startups. Before Lyft, he was a core part of the Startup Weekend team in Seattle, and he was in charge of hacker relations. So he did a lot of work with Google to run a bunch of pre-event boot camps and teach people about cool platforms, APIs, and technologies that they can use in their Startup Weekend projects. He was recently in the Philippines running the Startup Weekend Cebu and Startup Weekend Davao, and he had an awesome time, so he's returning to the Philippines for this event here. So everyone, welcome to the stage, Zachary Cohn. Yeah, yeah. I'm, hey, hey. <laughs> Maybe later. Maybe later. All right, hello, everybody. Um, as our amazing facilitator announced, my name is Zachary Cohn. Uh, I'm facilitating the whole track, so I had to introduce myself. Um, and I'm here to talk specifically about corporate innovation, so how big companies can think and act more like startups. But this is a lot of really good stuff for startups as well. So it's really going to be applicable to everyone in this room. So I want to start off with a message to any big companies out there. Brace yourself, because startups are coming. <laughs> some, people, some people have seen Game of Thrones. All right. <laughs> uh, so why should you care, right? You know, you're, you're a big company. You have hundreds of millions or maybe billions of pesos in revenue every year. You've got thousands or tens of thousands of employees. You've been around for maybe 100 years. Like, why, why should you be worried about this tiny little team of like three or four people with a million dollars in VC funding? Like, that's nothing, right? Nothing. Well, that's what all of the big retailers in the world were saying about 10 years ago about a little company called Amazon. And now, they're getting their asses handed to them, and they have no idea why, all right? They're, they're being disrupted by this technology company that no longer a startup, but they used to be a startup, Amazon, and, and they have no idea how to compete. And so, you know, they're wondering, like, what, what makes these startups so successful? Like, why are they able to disrupt us? Why are three or four people in their garage able to take out a company with, you know, offices all over the world? Maybe it's because they're, you know, have higher quality developers. Maybe it's that they just type faster, and they're just able to crank out more code than anybody else. You know, they don't really know, but what they do know is that if they don't change something, they're not going to be able to last much longer, all right? They're gonna, they recognize they're getting just thrashed, and eventually, these companies like Amazon are just gonna put them out of business. And so, the real question they're asking is, how do they compete, right? How do they compete with these startups? And as Sun Tzu said, to know your enemy, you must become your enemy, right? And so, in order for these big companies to beat startups, no offense to all you startups out there, they have to become a startup themselves, right? They have to they have to know why these startups are successful, what methodologies they're using, what practices, what they're doing so differently, and they have to figure out how they can do it themselves. And it won't be the same, but they need to figure something out. So lesson number one, you need to be problem focused, not solution focused. So raise your hand if this sounds familiar. Some, I haven't said anything, but, but thank you so much. <laughs> I'm calling on you for my first question. Uh, <laughs> Some VP or exec somewhere says, I have a vision for the new product or service we're going to build, right? You know, maybe it's based on market research, maybe it's based on a dream I had last night, but I know what we're going to do next. And so they spend months or maybe even years building this new product or service. They have hundreds or thousands of people working on it. They spend tens of millions or hundreds of millions of pesos developing it, and they launch it, and nothing really happens, right? Maybe, maybe it does okay. Maybe it's a huge flop, but chances are it's not that like out of the park success they're really hoping for. And the reason for that is because this methodology is old and busted, right? This methodology of I know what we need to build, so let's do that, is the old way of thinking. And startups can't do that, right? A startup has one shot. Maybe if you pivot early enough or fast enough, you get two, maybe three shots in kind of like a similar area, but you really get one shot. And a big company, they can afford to miss a few times, right? They can afford to launch a product that doesn't do so well because they've got like 50 other things going on. So if they want to keep competing, they need to stop 
being okay with these massive bets that are misses. And so the real question is, you know, there's a lot of stuff that people don't care about. People don't care about corporate initiatives, right? They don't care that you have decided that as a company you're gonna be more like this. They don't care about internal politics. They don't care about industry trends. And honestly, most people don't even care about features or technology. What customers really care about? No, what people really care about is having the problem solved, right? So if I have a dog and my dog smells bad, right, I, I want my dog to stop smelling bad. So I don't care if I'm using germs or microbes or nanobots to go in there and kill those little smell germs. I just care that my dog doesn't smell bad anymore. I don't care about any of the other things around it. I just care about my problem and it being solved. Because when it comes down to it, I have a life to live, right, as a person. As a consumer, as a customer, I have a life to live, and your product's only job is to make my life easier to live. It's the only reason people buy things, is to make their lives better, right? Or to fix a problem. So that is the new hotness of product development. It's the idea that you don't build what people want to build, you build what people want, all right? And so what this means is, and so I, I come from a developer background, I program a bit, and all you developers out there, even if they're in other tracks, I love you guys to death, but you guys are the worst at this, all right? Y you guys are like, oh, this, I just learned about this cool new API, or this cool new technology or program language, let's, let's use it, let's build something with this, right? And I, I love you guys to death, but you gotta stop, all right? Because what you want to build is not what customers want to buy, right? Maybe if you're really lucky, maybe you'll, you'll get luck into it, but chances are, you need to focus on building what people want, not just building what you want to build. Uh-oh, there we go. Lesson number two, what Eric Ries got wrong. So who here has heard of Eric Ries and the whole lean startup stuff? Yeah? Let's be a little bit more enthusiastic about raising our hands so I can actually see. There we go, there we go. So for those of you who haven't, and for those of you who have a good refresher, uh, this is kind of one of the core principles of this lean startup methodology. It's called a build, measure, learn loop. So the idea, do I have a laser pointer? I do have a laser pointer, cool. Uh, you build what's called an MVP, or a minimum viable product, right? That might mean, it might mean a little bit of code, it might mean paper prototypes, and there's a lot of things it could mean, but basically the smallest, tiniest, most, uh, most feature incomplete thing that you could possibly build to show someone and say, you know, hey, would you want this? Does this solve your problem? Then you launch that and you run a bunch of experiments and you measure your results. You have a bunch of data that you're collecting and you're measuring all that data. And then you know, go to the last stage, which is the learn phase, where you, you look at all your assumptions and you look at all the data and you say, okay, well, does this data validate my assumptions? Does this prove what I thought or does it disprove what I thought? Because often it will disprove your theory and then because it's a loop, you go through it again, and again, and again, and again, and again, until s theoretically you have a successful company, right? So the, the problem with this is it actually takes a fair bit of time to build something, even if it's of an MVP. It, you know, maybe it only takes a weekend, but that's two and a half days at a startup weekend, right? It takes a little bit of time, then you measure, and then you learn. It takes a little bit of time. So what if you could just learn? What if you could skip the build phase, and what if you could skip the measure phase too and just learn? And the way to do that is by talking to people. And I'm gonna rag on developers again. You guys are gonna hate this, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, but you need to go talk to people to validate or invalidate your assumptions. This comes from a methodology by a guy named Steve Blank, which is called customer development. So his whole thing is have an assumption. You know, um, let's go back to the dog smelling bad example, right? So, so maybe my company I wanna build is a shampoo to make dogs not smell bad anymore. So that's my assumption, that people want this shampoo to make dogs not smell bad. So instead of going to build a shampoo and then go out and test it on a bunch of dogs, what if instead I go talk to someone and I'm like, hey, you know, do, do you have a dog? I'd say yes. <laughs> Great, she has a dog, awesome, fantastic. Uh, does it ever smell bad? And you're like, yeah, sure, it, it smells bad sometimes. Like, doesn't it suck when your dog smells bad? Yeah, exactly, right? Um, so what if I had a way to make your dog not smell bad anymore? Does that sound interesting? Yeah, it sounds interesting. 
it's like, cool, well, you know, would you be interested in buying, you know, a shampoo for maybe $10 that makes your dog not smell bad anymore? And you're like, eh, yeah, like, I'd, maybe I'd be interested in that. And so great, you know, validated, right? Idea validated. My business will be a success. But let's, let's take a different approach. So what if I come back and I say, you know, do you have a dog? Because you're useless if you don't have a dog. <laughs> not that you're useless, but you're useless to me. <laughs> and so I'm like, great, like, well, what's, what sucks about having a dog? And you know, maybe, maybe she says, you know, it really interferes with my social life. You know, I have to come home after work, and instead of hanging out with my, my coworkers, um, I have to go walk my dog and make sure it goes to the bathroom and everything like that. I'm like, oh, interesting. You know, tell me more about that. Let me talk a little bit more. And then I'm like, okay, well, what else sucks about having a dog? And she's like, well, you know, my dog sheds everywhere. And then whenever I go out, you know, whether it's to work or to the bar or whatever, like, I'm just covered in dog hair all of the time, all of my clothes, and it's really frustrating. I'm like, oh, okay, tell me more, tell me more. But what, what else sucks about having a dog? And then they're like, well, you know, it's kind of embarrassing to admit, but like, my dog has some behavioral problems. It, it doesn't like strangers, it bit a couple people, and like, I, I don't know what to do about that. And you're like, oh, okay, okay. None of those things where her dog smells bad, right? And so this is a theoretical example, but I've seen it play out at Startup Weekends thousands of times where you, know, you ask, do you want a shampoo that makes your dog not smell bad? And they're like, yeah, I guess. But you ask them what their top three problems are, and they don't mention their dog smelling bad. So, so maybe they would buy a shampoo that makes the dog not smell bad, but maybe the market for that is like this big, right? But if you build a shampoo that made their dog not shed anymore, maybe the market for that is like this big, right? And so you never really would have found that with the, the lean startup build, measure, learn loop because you're, you're optimizing locally, which is not what you want to do. So, oops. so step one is talking to people to learn about their problems. And I'm actually going to give you guys a secret. I'll tell you what step two is. Step two is build a product that solves those problems. All right? Another great example of when this can be useful is I'm sure everyone has been in this situation where you're in a, a big team meeting and you've got maybe two or three or 10 or 20 people there, and people start arguing. You know, should we include feature X? Should we do this or that? Or should we market it this way or that way? You know, where should we spend our time? Uh, you, can, you can argue and conjecture and say, well, I think that customers want this. Or it makes sense that our consumers would want that. Or you can just go talk to people and then have facts, right? <laughs> you can say, like, well, based on my conversation with John, John said that he needs this, this, and this, or that his problem is this. And based on my conversation with Minette in Manila, she said that this, this, and this. And so let's make decisions based on facts and not decisions based on conjecture. Lesson number three, 100 startups fail and one succeeds. So uh, Bowen mentioned this in his talk yesterday. Uh, in Silicon Valley, all the low-hanging fruit is gone, right? And so any problem is probably a pretty difficult problem. And even with that, there are 100 companies working to solve that exact same problem at any given time, any problem, right? And so what ends up happening is most of them die, but occasionally you know, one will succeed. And it turns out the startups are less like this, giant building story tall you know, mechanical robots that are pretty difficult to kill. And they're more like this, cockroaches. Any individual cockroach has a pretty low chance of surviving. You know, it's pretty easy to just like accidentally even step on a cockroach, and then it's dead. But as a swarm of cockroaches, you know, some of them are bound to survive, right? Some of them are bound to succeed. So big companies have an advantage. What do you think that advantage is? They have a tremendous amount of money, right, compared to a startup. You know, may, maybe they're not like super profitable, maybe they're not Apple or Google, but big companies have a lot more money than any startup does, and so they can use that, right? So instead of, uh, you know, putting all of their money on one big bet and hoping that that one succeeds, they can try a lot of different things, right? They don't have to be a cockroach and try just one thing and hope it succeeds like a startup would. This is where they're different than startups. They can be a swarm of cockroaches, right? They can try a hundred things. You know, if, uh, if Globe or Smart or one of the other big companies here in the Philippines dedicated, I don't know how much money, but dedicated a hundred people, right, to experimenting around some new problem that they want to solve, and instead of sending those hundred people off to solve that problem together, they split them into 
10 teams of 10 people or 20 teams of five people, they could have 20 different solutions to that problem and they could go experiment with all 20 solutions and then see which one seems like it'll be the most successful, right? And that will be crazy because then when you find the one that is successful, even after a whole lot of false starts, where you, it just, most, it just doesn't go anywhere. It's really sad, really sad. But then eventually, she pushes a little bit harder, it hits the next one, and then they all fall down, and that's when you go super saiyan, right? That's when you dump all of your money into that one, and you really charge it up, and then it goes crazy, and it makes you a bajillion dollars. It creates a new industry, it creates a whole new market, and that is when, as a big company, you can really innovate really, really well. So recap time. How can big companies stay innovative? And for all you startups out there, how can you guys make sure that you're doing a better job than the big companies who weren't here at this conference? Because you guys have an advantage now. You know the secrets. They don't. Focus on the problem, not on the solution. I don't want to hear you say, uh, oh, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm talking to you, I'm like, oh, what do you do? I don't want you to say, oh, we have this new facial recognition technology that can, uh, you know, do you take a picture of your face and it can tell if you're lying, tell if you're scared or upset or happy or sad. It's like that, cool story, bro, but like, that's not a business, right? That's a technology, and that's great, but it's not a business, it's not a startup. So instead, tell me like, oh, well, haven't you ever, you know, you know, I'm a parent, I'm not a parent, but this other theoretical person is a parent, and sometimes they find their kid with their hand in the cookie jar, and the cookie jar is empty, right? And they're like, little Johnny, did you steal all the cookies? And they're like, no, no. Well, now you have an app, and you can just take a picture of their face, and you know they're lying, right? You can get them in trouble. <laughs> That is a startup, maybe, maybe, maybe not. But it's not a technology is the thing. Number two, don't jump into lean startup. Do customer development first. If you want more resources on this, you can talk to me. I've got, we're actually producing a lot of resources around this that are just free on YouTube and on our blog, but there's a lot of other good blog posts and books about this as well. I really encourage anyone who's doing product development, whether you're a big company or a startup, to research customer development, right? Research these customer interviews and go talk to your customers before you ever write a single line of code. They will tell you what to build, then all you have to do is build it and then take their money. It's so great, it's so easy. Number three is experiment a lot. As a startup, this is a little bit harder, but you can do it in very small batches. As a big company, it's a little easier and you can do it in some slightly bigger batches and you can run a lot more experiments and it's fantastic. So sometimes you'll find something that you don't understand you just, you just kind of get, and you, I don't know why that just sucks my mouth in, right? And sometimes, it's a little bit dark, but sometimes things won't go the way you planned, right? And you're making a pot and then all of a sudden your head explodes and then the pot falls apart. <laughs> Worst day ever, right? Worst birthday ever. But keep these three lessons in mind and you as a big company can stay relevant and stay innovative and you as a startup can take out some of the big companies that aren't in this room today. So to, in conclusion, um, I was going to tell one last story, but I want to give you guys a choice. Do you want to hear another story, or do you want to see another backflip? Backflip? All right. Cheer if you want to hear a story. Wow, no cheers at all. Wow. I said cheer, and you guys raised your hand. Disqualified. Disqualified. Cheer if you want to see a backflip. Thank you very much and have a great day. Wow, that was a great talk. Wasn't that great? I had so much fun. Man, I, you know, I was, I was sitting in the back and, and then I had to go to the bathroom so I left for a little while and I missed what lesson number two was but it couldn't have been that important. But, but it was a lot of fun to watch. Thanks very much, Zach. Thanks very much. Thanks, Zach. It was good to be here. Our next presenter for today.